Hi, I'm Mason Vale from Boise State University, and this video will be talking about abstraction in object-oriented programming. Depending on where you look, abstraction may or may not be listed as a full-blown pillar of object-oriented programming, but it's definitely a big idea worth talking about. Abstraction isn't always given full pillar status because you could consider it to be the flip side of encapsulation. Encapsulation says an object's data and inner workings should be protected and hidden behind a limited public interface. That public interface then abstracts the object's inner workings from the outside world. Abstraction says you should be able to work with an object without needing to know its inner workings, using only a limited public interface. Hiding the inner workings then is encapsulation, so either one can be said to imply the other. If that's the limit of how I wanted to view abstraction, I could end the video now. But I'm discussing abstraction as its own topic because it can occur at different levels than just a single object, and I think it's beneficial to be aware of where else abstraction can be used. Without necessarily linking it to encapsulation, abstraction is the idea that you can work with an object knowing only a description of its purpose and a set of its public methods. That description provides a mental model of what the object is supposed to do in response to actions. It's not necessary to know the details of how it does what it does, and the way you're thinking about the object may not even represent everything the object could do. We deal with abstractions in the real world all the time. Consider calculators. You've likely used dozens of different calculators in your life. Most calculators share a common, well-defined interface. There are buttons for numbers and basic mathematical operations and a display for inputs and results. Inside the calculator may be vacuum tubes, transistors, microchips, or even a tiny gnome performing rapid calculations with a slide rule and an abacus. How the calculator produces its answers doesn't matter to you, as long as you get the right answer when you input 1 plus 1 equals. When working with an object in programming, the user does not need to know how any of the methods work as long as they do what the documentation says they'll do. The object is a black box with a few exposed knobs and levers. All the machinery is hidden inside, abstracted away. It's very unlikely that you were shown any of the code inside the common classes you were introduced to early in your programming career. You simply started using them after reading their documentation or being told how to use them and what to expect from their methods. How does the math square root method work? How are characters managed inside string? How does scanner tokenize input streams? How does system.out.println make characters appear in the standard output stream? What is the function that generates random numbers in random? Knowing how these classes do their jobs wasn't necessary to use them. Documentation of the public interface was all that was needed. Abstraction can be taken even further than working with one encapsulated object of a known type. It's not even necessary to know what object is doing the job when you call a method. Any compatible object could be stored in a polymorphic reference. Knowledge of the reference type abstraction is all that's necessary to work with any of the limitless possible objects stored in that reference. Those objects may be capable of many operations beyond the reference type, but as long as it's being used as the reference type, you can treat it simply as the reference type. This happens a lot when passing object references as arguments to methods. For example, when you pass an object reference to system.out.println, the printline method takes a polymorphic object reference and accesses its toString method. The printline method never knows or cares exactly what kind of object it's working with. It only needs to know that it's working with the object abstraction, a thing that has toString method as part of its functionality. Interfaces are ideal for defining an abstraction. Interfaces define expected behavior from objects that implement the interface without having any say in how those behaviors will be implemented. Any object that implements the interface could be assigned to a polymorphic reference of that interface type. At the time you call a method using that interface, you may not even know what object is found at the other end of the reference, but as long as it does the expected job, you can use it and move on. Abstraction isn't just about enabling programmers to be ignorant of how objects do their jobs, although that actually is a benefit, as the programmer can stay focused on solving their problem without getting distracted by every line of code in every class. Abstraction also allows us to write flexible modular programs where compatible replacement components can be swapped out without replacing a lot of hard-coded specific class type references. Suppose we have a program that needs a container to store objects in no particular order. All our container needs is a method to add objects one at a time and another to retrieve them one at a time in no particular order. 
If we define an interface storage that describes that idea and those methods, we could write many classes to satisfy that abstraction. This code is an example of how a storage interface might look. It's a very simple abstraction. Nearly any kind of data structure could be used in a class that implements this interface. You could imagine objects being in a bag, a box, a list, a tree, or any other kind of container. As long as you can add them one at a time and get them back one at a time, the object will fit this abstraction adequately, and you know all you need to know just from the descriptions in this document. Our first attempt at writing a class to fit the storage abstraction might be the Big Iron Bucket class. It's a little clunky, but it's just our first try. In our program, we would create a variable of type storage, to which we would assign an instance of Big Iron Bucket. Throughout the rest of the program, we would always work with the storage abstraction. We can forget that behind the scenes is a Big Iron Bucket. Later, we may find that while the Big Iron Bucket does its job, we can make a Kevlar SAC class that also implements the storage interface, but it has much less overhead and works better in our program. We can change the storage assignment from a Big Iron Bucket object to a Kevlar SAC object, and everything else in the program will continue to work as before, because it only ever required that the object we're using is some kind of storage. I hope this video has helped you appreciate the role of abstraction in object-oriented programming. Thank you for watching.